Double time, double time. To get up, to get up, move it, move it, move it. Come on, move it, move it. Go, let's go, let's go. Keep it moving. Now, Ryan, I want you to go straight to class today. Why should I? Because I said so. Big deal. You mind your manners, mister. I don't have to. Bird face. That does it. You're in trouble. Oh, I'm just really scared. Oh. Oh. Help you, ma'am. Yes, officer. My son, Brian, is always late for school. Could you speak to him? Perhaps give him a little scare? Certainly, ma'am. Hi, Brian. It's almost 800 hours. Time to deploy for school. I'll go when I'm ready. You're ready now, mister. <laughs> now move it, move it, move it! Thank you, officer. No problem, ma'am. So welcome to Trimming the Movie Fab, the podcast where we trim films from franchises that don't belong. I'm Stephen Nicholson. And I'm Paul Nicholson. And today we're joining Captain Harris and Proctor in their cop car en route to the police academy, where we'll assess which films in the franchise will pass the recruitment process and which will fail the test and be put in the slammer. So we're going to, first of all, rank the first three police academy films top, middle, or lower tier in this episode. And then the next one, return for episodes four through seven. So we'll share some Police Academy facts, provide an overview of each movie, and share our thoughts on each. Any day now, Mahoney, and your little ass is mine. You wanted to see me, sir? Mahoney, didn't your mother teach you how to knock? It depends. Sir, I hope this isn't going to be too personal. I heard what you said about my little butt, and I don't know how to break this to you, sir, but I'm straight. So, Paul, do you have a, a favourite scene from the, the Police Academy movies? Probably the second one, just maybe Zed when he's in the, the supermarket with his friends and they're just like going round the shop. <laughs> he's also kind of trying to be a tough guy, but then he he's not happy with the guy who hands of meat and he goes, I'm a vegetarian, do you know, stuff like that. I, just, I, just, I think kind of Zed steals the show. So maybe part two when he goes to the theme park as well and they, uh, <laughs> he shakes hands with the mayor. <laughs> I voted for you. Will you go on the big wheel with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. I'll go on it if you go on it. <laughs> I get it sort <laughs> So probably those bits. I mean, there's so many, but... Yeah. but there we Yeah, I agree. I think um, for me it'd be anything from the, the second movie where it involves uh, Mauser or <laughs> um, <laughs> or uh, Sweet Chuck and Zed. I think all, all yeah. of their scenes are, are very funny. But if, 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 if I had to pick a specific scene it would be from Police Academy 2 where the kid won't get out of the car at the school oh, and the mum yeah. asks Tackleberry for help and getting getting the kid out and the kid <laughs> says no I'm not getting out you'll get out right now mister and he shoots the gas canister through the window <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's that's probably the, the, the my bomb, favourite the... scene uh, yeah and, and uh, what, what's your favourite movie out of the whole franchise? Funnily enough, we were just talking about probably the second one, their first assignment. Just, I just think it's quite underrated. I think the first one kind of gets all plodders. Obviously, it's a great film, but for me, I've always liked the second one. I always preferred the second one. Mm -hmm. Me too. So, you, you yeah, me too. too. Um, and I think mm -hmm. the other thing about, yeah, I mean, I suppose there's, I mean, these movies on on rewatching them, and I've I've watched. 
rewatch one to three so far for the first time in a long, long time. So I've still to watch four through seven. They are very much a product of of their time. There's no getting away from it, and yeah. there's a lot of stuff there you wouldn't get away with now. I mean, for example, in the the third one with the the exchange police officer who's from the far oh, east, yeah. is he China? I can't remember which country it's from. Japanese, yeah, some of the way, yeah. the way Japanese the maybe. Manchu, okay, some of the way Manchu, he's described. Yeah. You would not. Yeah, yeah, and, and all yeah. that, and the kind of all the uh, you would expect the the stereotypes um, are, are 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 there. I think homosexuality as well. With the is it the blue oyster, oyster bar, oyster bar, which yeah. which is is funny. Yeah, I mean, that's one of my favourite mm. parts of the movies. The mm. the recurring uh, visits to the blue oyster bar, but again, mm. uh, it's a very stereotypical um, yeah. view of you know homosexuality there and. And the men, the straight men, being afraid to go in there. Look, sir. Maybe they serve seafood. <laughs> Not funny, you idiot. What are you looking at, you peckerhead? Nice uniform. Makes me wish I'd worn my sailor outfit. I'm getting out of here. Move it, move it, move it. <laughs> I don't think Cunningham's allowed, sir. Nice collar. And even, uh, I think, the racism with, I think, the first movie when the, the new recruits first arrive and one of the guys oh, yeah. that recruits says something like, oh, there's a lot of spades here. And again, you know, <laughs> and then he looks high. It's funny because they all stand up like, to, again, to the new Yeah. There are a lot of spades around here. <laughs> Which I think is good. Right. <laughs> but you wouldn't get away with that now. And similarly, the sexism. It's, I think, the third movie there where the new recruits arrive and you've got the attractive blonde and Mahoney's straight over there. Ben Mike, oh, he's yeah. the sergeant. He's the one, the authority mm. figure, and he's straight over saying, Yeah, you're rooming with me. We have to take showers together. He's up <laughs> within his first 30 seconds of meeting her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your name, cadet? Thompson, sir. You live around here? No, sir. What's your telephone number, Thompson? Come on, um, eyes front telephone number. Five 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 two four six seven, sir. Okay. Let's see the thighs. Come on, come on. I haven't got all day the thighs. What in the hell are you doing? Meeting women, sir. What's your name, dirtbag? Mm. Dirtbag. Your name. Mahoney, sir. <laughs> so. They, they are a product of their time, yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get away from most of that these days. Mm -hmm. And and why, I mean, one of the things, and obviously we have a real fondness for these movies because from the second one, uh, I think through the fifth, that was very much, there, were, there was one every year, and we as a family went there. So obviously you, me, mum and dad and Donna mm -hmm. went to see them. So we've got fond memories of going to see these and having a good time with them. But now, you know, you look back and you see, other than really the first one, they're not that well regarded at all. And no. people are a bit sniffy about them. And mm. what, why do you think that is? I don't know. Just, they were almost a, a little bit like the 80s version of the Carry On films in some ways. They were a bit like that. And it's quite slapstick. And obviously, not going to stop away with the quality trained from each each film each sequel got worse really so I, I, I don't know I don't know to be honest I don't it was just snobbery really it's like they're not meant to be taken seriously mm -hmm. that's the whole point of them you know do you, do you have a, a strange one do you have an answer why do you think I don't I don't it's I, I think just uh, certain things get labelled or branded and people you know are like sheep and they go along with it. Um, mm -hmm. but, I mean, if, you, if you're just looking for, especially the first two movies, if you're just looking for a movie or movies to put on and just have a laugh, then, yeah, brilliant. Come at me with an imaginary knife. Do I have to? Yes, you do. I'm not joking. Come on. Come on. <sighs> no! Ouch! Ouch! <laughs> 
Okay. That's how it's done. Who's next? That's me! I love it! I love to go. I love to go. We'll both go. Paul, do you have an, an interesting police academy fact? So apparently, when it got to the third police academy film, Zed wanted more. No, he, I think he wasn't going to do it. The character who played Zed, Zed, Bob Coldway, or something these days. And what they, they said, all right, we want you in it, so we'll up your salary. But then he said, I don't enough the person who he always argues with, Sweet Chuck, you know, the actor, you know, Sweet Chuck, the guy that he always kind of bullies. Apparently they were good friends and he actually said, well, I'll only do it if you, you pay him the same. And they agreed to it. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, well, mine says that Steve Gutenberg, who's obviously the lead in the first four movies, he uh, wasn't actually going to return for the, the sequel, Police Academy mm -hmm. 2 because he didn't like the script and he only came back when there was uh, rewrites for the script mm. and his salary was bumped up <laughs> so <laughs> although do you, do you know one of the things i was thinking today about steve gutenberg actually how incredibly successful he was from the mid 80s mid 80s through to the end right when you consider yeah. he had the police academy series he had Three Men and a Baby in its sequel, Short Circuit Cocoon. in its sequel, and yeah, I think Cocoon. Cocoon in its sequel. I mean, these were all big, big hits. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a, a pretty impressive hot streak over, what, a six-year period, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a shame because I really like him, but I think almost like he's seen as part of the 80s almost. And so when the 90s came, it was a shame kind of like forgotten about it was always seen as or he's the 80s and we've moved on from that now yeah. maybe a bit like phil collins in the music sense but it's a shame because mm -hmm. i think he ended up doing like cinderella pantomimes and stuff you know <laughs> like in recent years great news in order to celebrate the release of police academy 5 warner home video is reducing the price on the funniest foursome of cop capers to hit your video store that's right, you can get Police Academies 1, 2, 3, and 4 for the low price of just $19.98 each. So, whether by land, by sea, by air, or even by chair, get down to your local video store to get in on the Police Academy action. Come on, you little rookies, get on the program. So, get on the ball and get your copies of Police Academy 1, 2, 3, and 4 at the new low price of just $19.98 per cassette. Now you move it, move it, move it. You heard the man. So scramble down to your store to buy the comedies that'll have you rolling with laughter. We'll show you a good time. We'll show yeah. you a great time. <laughs> great news. In order to celebrate the release of Police Academy 5, Warner Home Video is reducing the price on the funniest foursome of cop capers to hit your video store. That's right. You can get Police Academies 1, 2, 3, and 4 for the low price of just $19.98 each. So, whether by land, by sea, by air, or even by chair. Get down to your local video store to get in on the Police Academy action. Come on, you little rookies. Get on the program. So get on the ball and get your copies of Police Academy 1, 2, 3, and 4 at the new low price of just $19.98 per cassette. Now you move it, move it, move it. You heard the man. So scramble down to your store to buy the comedies that'll have you rolling with laughter. We'll show you a good time. We'll show yeah. you a great time. <laughs> Okay, Police Academy is a series of American comedy films written by Paul Maslansky, the first six of which were made in the 1980s and the seventh in 1994. So the series opened with Police Academy in 1984 and followed a group of misfit recruits in their attempts to prove themselves capable of being police officers and succeeding both in spite of and because of their eccentricities. So the main character in the first four films is Carrie Mahoney, played by Steve Gutenberg, and he is a repeat offender forced to join the police academy as a punishment. Uh, the seventh and to date last installment, Mission to Moscow, was released in 1994, and in addition, an animated TV series ran from 1988 to 89, with also a live action series running in 1997 for 26 episodes. In September 2018, Gutenberg announced that a new Police Academy film was in development. And here we are, Paul, six years later, and I haven't heard a thing about it. 
And as the buses unloaded, a very kind of zigzag zebra line formed, and I noticed that it was the most diverse group of uh, policemen I had ever seen. There were men and there were women and there were every color of the rainbow and fat and thin. And I called the uh, cadre officer over, a sergeant. He said, well, look, we have a fair employment hiring practice here. And uh, we have to take in virtually everybody that applies to the academy. And then he looked around and he winked. He said, but we can flunk them out after three weeks. No! And that night I went home and I thought about it. I said, uh, what if a group of these people that were accepted to the police academy, what if they decided that they're not going to be thrown out and they, they're determined to stay? Okay, we've just returned from the Blue Oyster Bar with Lonks and Copeland and having watched all three movies, listeners, here's your podcast. Crime. The city was full of it. Hey! Three TVs! Desperate measures were needed. I want you to go to the police academy. The police academy is such a dangerous place. Honey, don't worry. Desperate measures were taken. I'm joining the police force! <laughs> the mayor says we have to take this riffraff. I'm trapped here? Well, yes. We all are. What about guns? When do we get guns? You won't be schooled in firearms, police procedures, local laws, and many, many other things. High speed driving. Police Academy. Where did you get this gun? My mom gave it to me. Mister, I am warning you, hot They're lean. Mean. Does the radio bother you? Five. I can turn it down. Obscene. Each and every one of them striving to defend. You make me sick. Thank you, sir. I make everybody sick. I see the thighs. Or upend. Come on, come on. I haven't got all day the thighs. And now that they're ready for the real world. Give me the thing! Crime is no longer a number one problem. They are. Can you get my kitty cat out of the tree? No problem, ma'am. Police Academy. Your father was a police officer. So what do you think your father, or how do you think your father is going to react to this movie? Oh, he saw it. He liked it. He loved it. He thought it was really funny. He had a good time. Um, you know, the movie's not a movie like Coma or Hospital in which physicians would be offended. Uh, this is a movie, it's a comedy, and it's very, uh, very... Uh, it's very easy to see that nothing here is taken seriously. So if it was the police academy or it was a hotel or it was a restaurant or it was a health club, it would all be the same. I mean, it's all taken in, you know, in farce. So it's a lot of fun. Police Academy has an uncanny ability to miss the punchline in joke after joke. There are scenes in this movie that are so pointless, it's not just that they're not funny, we can't even figure out why they're in the film. What is this doing here? When is it that it isn't funny? We don't know. Another thing, the movie allegedly takes place in the United States, but this police academy is like no American police academy I've ever heard of. It's a 14-week boarding school. Maybe they meant to call it Military Academy and they changed their mind. I think that's because it was shot in Toronto and uh, so that there's this whole Canadian sensibility to what's going on there. It isn't like any police academy I've ever heard of either. Mm -hmm. I want to quote back to you the line that you used a little earlier in evaluating this film. This movie is bad. It's was, shockingly uh, bad. <laughs> <laughs> they cut away from what's funny frequently. Those jokes at least mm -hmm. paid off. The mm -hmm. tilted car, everyone raising their hand. But more often than not, Mm -hmm. Just when this film is building up a head of steam, they cut away from the mm -hmm. joke. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it. It's there, stunning. There were a couple of scenes in the movie where somebody walks on screen and says something, somebody else yes. comes in, and a situation is set up for joke, and then end, end. Yeah. No payoff, no failed joke. Yeah. Just it's over, and you say, "What was that? It went by, and it never came back this again." This is as much of an imitation of Private Benjamin as it is of uh, Airplane, actually, and it's 
Noah in that class. You're right. Quoted thumbs down on Police Academy, one of the most inept and idiotic comedies in a long time. Okay. First up, Police Academy from 1984, directed by Hugh Wilson. So the plot for this one, in a desperate need of a fresh batch of police officers, the newly appointed Lady Mayoress of a crime-plagued metropolis lowers the bar for the recruitment process. As a result, all types of misfits start flocking into Commandant Eric Lissard's prestigious police academy, and the leader of this assortment of pariahs is Kenny Mahoney, a light-hearted, devil-may-care young rebel. But now, there is no turning back. And to make matters worse, the autocratic Martinet Lieutenant Harris can't wait to see them quit. Then, a full-scale riot breaks out, and the inexperienced but dauntless cadets will have to put their training to good use. Do they have what it takes to be law enforcement officers? So the gross in this one, it grossed just under 150 million US dollars on a budget of four and a half million. And its profit multiplier, well, it made over 33 times its budget. And it is the most commercially successful film in the franchise. Uh, it was the sixth highest grossing movie of 19. 19- 84. So one of the movie mistakes in here, as the giant camera booth hits the water, the top black panel falls off, but is in place again for the next shot. So ratings wise, it has a 56% fresh Rotten Tomatoes score from the critics and a 64% Rotten Tomatoes audience score. Over on IMDb, it has a 6.7 out of 10 audience rating and a 41 out of 100 critic meta score. So here's a fact for you. After early test, audiences responded mostly positively to Hightower out of all the characters. Uh, Hightower, played by Bubba Smith, was moved to second villain just behind Steve Gutenberg's Mahoney. And in summary, a good old fashioned comedy film with tongue firmly in its cheek. The best way to enjoy this film is by viewing it as very much a product of the time, which which we said earlier on. Mm. So, Paul, do you remember when and where you first seen Police Academy? We were going to see it in Jersey, or my mum and dad didn't realise it was a 15. So, obviously, at that point, we were... I was 10, you were 7. 10, and I'd be 7. So, we we ended up going to see Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, but that's something, that's another story. I actually think I saw the second one first, and then saw the first one on video. So, I think probably on video rented it on video, maybe in 85 or 86 maybe. I think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the thing for me, can you believe this is 40 years old? <laughs> I know. Yeah, 40 years old. Um, I know. Yeah, a 15, so I, I think I had to rent the video. Because uh, I know we've seen uh, Police Academy 2 in the cinema um, the, mm-hmm. the, the year after. Uh, so anyway, what do, what do you think of uh, the, the original movie? Yeah, it's just really funny. Like, it's a product of its time, but it's just quite slapstick, but I like it. It's fun because you always used to see the advert on TV and it was the old lady asking Tackleberry to help her with her cat stuck up the tree. And you always used to see that and thought, oh, that looks really <laughs> funny. It's just a really good, really good cast as well. And cause I suppose in the 80s, things were serious. And it was all, I suppose, society. It was a bit more about money and greed and stuff. So this was actually a welcome thing to come along, actually, and, and amongst all that. And, not take itself too seriously and yeah and then it spawned all the sequels so you know this is this was a good starting point and obviously some people would return some people wouldn't for the sequels so. but yeah really good film it is i mean this movie is a comedy did it make me laugh yes did it make me laugh a lot yes it's funny it's still funny and this is the first time i'd watched it in decades and i mean the plot i mean it's a slim plot it's just really <laughs> It's a setup for gags, isn't it? <laughs> and um, mm. and the cast, the cast really make it because each of the characters have their own trait or Essex Trinity, their own eccentricities, even uh, which they play to perfection, which endears us to them, especially as the series progresses. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the other things that stuck out were actually how good the soundtrack is by Robert Folk. Mm. It's got that iconic main theme. But yeah, really good yeah. soundtrack there. Um, obviously Kim Cattrall, uh, later of 
well, Sex and the City is our most famous mm, that's acting right, yeah. gig. But I will say uh, uh, quite an early prominent role for her in here. I think Lieutenant Harris is a brilliant bad guy. Really, mm. really good in it. And yeah, there's just, you know lots of really good standout moments. I mean, what are some of the highlights for you? When they say something, but they, there's always like a comeback stuff. It's like somebody says something that's racist. They'll then realise that somebody there is much bigger than them. And it's like they suddenly shut up. And uh, just Mahoney is just, he's brilliant. He's just so funny as well. And the music as well, like you say, the music, because what's really good about it, it's timeless because the theme is just, it could have been done any decade. It's not like dated. It wasn't done. It could have been done on a synthesizer or something that reflect like when it came out, but it didn't. So that's what makes it even more timeless and famous, probably. The, the theme, uh, of course, Tackleberry. I've not mentioned Tackleberry that much, but he's he's one of the, the best things about the franchise as well. I mean, yeah, Tackleberry is obviously the kind of gun nut, the army nut. Mm. Um, he was played by David Graff, and, and, yeah. and obviously, in one scene in the movie, they're playing music, he's playing the saxophone. And actually, in real life, mm-hmm. he did play the. He was an accomplished saxophone player, but he's just one of the, the cast who died quite young. For me, yeah. obviously, researching this when you're going, and obviously, it's forty years since the first one. So, I mean, obviously, a lot of people died of uh, just because of the passage of time. But there was quite a number of people that were in these movies who died way too young, and, and David Graff is one of them. I think he was only in his 2001, 50s, wasn't he? 2001 or something. Yeah. I think it was a heart attack, maybe, or something. Yeah. Very sad. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of the highlights in this movie for me, uh, the, the Blue Oyster Bar is always funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I think the, the podium, when <laughs> Commander oh, yeah. uh, Lassard's <laughs> doing his speech, and he's, they've got the, the prostitutes underneath the, the podium. Uh, helping him with something. Uh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> now this first slide shows a very, very interesting thing. Our main building. In slide two, we see another view of it. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. The person, that, apparently she was an adult actress, an adult movie actress, the actual the oh, person right. that plays, yeah, Mahoney's friend. <laughs> right. You mentioned it already, Tackleberry, shooting the cat out of the tree <laughs> to help the old lady get it back. You get my kitty cat out of the tree. No problem, ma'am. I think the other uh, Sergeant Callahan uh, demoing, um, and for those that don't know, Sergeant Callahan is tall, blonde with big boobs, and she's uh, demoing self defense in the judo match. And oh, she yeah. <laughs> uh, gets one of the recruits down, and, and she's kind of sitting on him, uh, mm. it's nearly sitting on his face. And then she's like, Right, who wants to have a go next? And all the guys put their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, and, and one of the funny bits at the beginning is when the new recruits all arrive and Kyle, who's one of the two, if you like, bad guys um, in it, uh, he, goes, he goes up to Chief Chief Hurst, I think it is, Hurst. and he's saying, yeah, obviously, he's here, and, <laughs> and, Hurst, <laughs> and he just tells him to, <laughs> in a, a yeah. not very polite way, to, to get away from him. Get at Kyle Blake's reporting for duty, sir. Get away from me, you asshole. Yes, sir. Good. But yeah, lots and lots of really funny scenes in this movie. It still, it still um, gives you a good time, giving it a watch. Mm. And that's another thing about these movies. They're, they're nice and short. They're only ever, what, just under 90 minutes. They're all under 90 yeah. minutes, yeah. That's good. Paul, so where would you rank in terms of the Police Academy movies, top middle or lower tier? Oh, yep, I agree with you. It goes in my top tier as well. So let's turn our attention now to Police Academy 2. Lock your doors. Activate the dog. Stand up the man. Stretch the wire. 
because they've taken to the streets. They're the graduates of Police Academy, turned loose on their first assignment. You gotta build a trust between you and the people, and they'll respect you. They're armed. Now look, I'm serious. And they're dangerous. Oh, I'm sorry. Mahoney. You have the right to sing the blues. You have the right to cable TV. It's a nice piece. Tackleberry. I was referring to your sidearm. High Tower. Yo! Yo? Yo, sir! Jones. <laughs> Hooks. The back! Captain Lazard. Commandant Lazard. <laughs> and the lovable Lieutenant Mauser. It's Captain Mauser. Last year, they were in training. Time to deploy for school. I'll go when I'm ready. You're ready now, mister. <laughs> this year, they're in charge. Police Academy, their first assignment. Sir Paul Maslansky and Warner Brothers did such a great job. And you know, even broad comedies, they have to have a great story and a great plot and great timing. You know, the, what's the secret of comedy timing? Yeah. So that's the whole game, and Police Academy just works. I mean, it's 35 years old. Someone told me they're having a big celebration everywhere uh, about it. A lot of places are celebrating it, and it still plays. It still holds up. Yeah, I'm really lucky. Well, I'll say this much for Police Academy 2. It has two more laughs in it than the first picture, which means it has a total of two laughs in it. Mm -hmm. One is a brief sight gag involving the smelliest recruit when he takes off his socks in a locker room and flicks them in his locker, but well, they stick to the locker. Mm -hmm. That's disgusting, and it's funny. The other gag involves one recruit who loves karate and also can imitate all sorts of sounds, including, and this is kind of funny too, the sounds that come out of an actor's mouth in a low-budget karate film with the words completely, completely missing the actor's lips. I thought that was funny. Those are two funny bits that last a total of perhaps 10 seconds. Unfortunately, Police Academy 2 lasts about 90 minutes longer than that. Uh, there was one other thing in it that I kind of liked, and that was the leader of the evil gang that walks around with marbles in his mouth or bowling balls and talks funny. It got old, though. It got old because they had nothing, nowhere to go with it and nothing to do with it, except he came on, he was funny, and then he was funny over and over and over again because they were so desperate. And, you know, there are so many police movies around and so many cop shows on television and so many sources of inspiration mm -hmm. that they shouldn't, it seems to me, have just made the same story again, more or less, which is the same bunch of bumbling recruits no particular plot for them to get involved in. It's uh, uh, I, I, no satire, you know, no satirical approach to the material. To me, it's recycling stuff that I saw on um, situation comedy shows 20 years ago on TV and mm -hmm. not doing it as well, not with as much wit as with much charm. The characters aren't developed. It's mechanisms for uh, dirty jokes, basically. Mm -hmm. It's sort of sad when you sit there, actually. I don't, I feel bad. Uh, that I'm there. Feel bad that people spent money and they're out to have a good time, and this is what they're given. Um, so, Police Academy 2, their first assignment, 1985, directed by Jerry Paris. And the plot for this one after graduating in the first Police Academy, Carrie Mahoney and the rest of his hapless fellow officers are assigned to a precinct commanded by Captain Pete Lassard, played by <laughs> Howard Hesman. His district is being harassed by a gang led by Zed, <laughs> Bob Goldthwait. Um, so given 30 days to shape up or lose his post, Lassard struggles to discipline his incompetent new charges, while subordinate Lieutenant Mauser, <laughs> played by Art Petrano, plots to take his job away. Um, so there we are, already a couple of brilliant new characters in there. Yeah. Uh, so the gross in this one, it grossed $115 million on a budget of $7.6 million, so it made almost 15 times its budget, and it is the second highest grossing movie in the franchise, and it was the 11th highest grossing movie of 1985. So, movie mistake, uh, when there is a fight at the Blue Oyster Bar and Hooks uh, goes to find their dress, Proctor says their dress is 621 Cowan Avenue, but when Mahoney and Hightower get there, the number on the door says 655. Although that's quite a funny moment, isn't it? Um, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he knows the address of the gay bar <laughs> off the top of his head. <laughs> he knows the address, yeah. <laughs> uh, so ratings wise, uh, we, 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 we plummet here, don't we? So um, 28% Rotten Tomato score from the critics, 42% Rotten Tomatoes audience score on IMDb. It has a 5.8 out of 10 audience rating and a 39 out of 100 critic meta score. So things have dipped there. And here's a fact for you. 
the only movie, or it is the only movie in the original Police Academy heptilology in which Callahan, played by Leslie Easterbrook, does not appear. Um, which I never found out until I was reading this note you put in here, Paul, that after the first film was completed, she was pregnant and had a baby daughter, uh, which, which prevented her from working on the sequels. Film summary, while often seen as inferior in comparison to its predecessor, this certainly packs a punch and introduces the wonderful Z. What more can you want? So we've seen this at the cinema, right, didn't we? Like we talked about, it's my favourite one in the franchise. Just, it's probably a bit of nostalgia as well, because that was the first film we saw. I love Mah- how Mahoney's character develops as well, and, and Z bringing Z into it totally changes it. And I love the bit as well when they go, not the old Joe, the new Zoo, and then Mahoney's trying to pretend he's like, he goes, you're a cop. And he takes his moustache and goes, no, you're an ugly cop. And he goes, no, I'm a singer. <laughs> and he's like, I'm making <laughs> It's supposed to be undercover and it just, this sort of karaoke style microphone. So it's just hilarious, you know. Sunday, Sunday at Raceway Park. Dragsters, top viewers, incredible wheels. Yo, why? Ah! 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 This is a consistently, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it, right? This is one of my favourite comedies of all time. I, I love this movie. Um, I think it's consistently funnier than the first one. Um, I think this one, is, it's actually quite different um, compared to the first movie. I think this movie owes a lot more to the Zucker brothers who did the likes of Airplane, Top Secret, mm. Naked Done. It, it's more of that kind of comedy style. Uh, I think the introduction of some brilliant new characters in here, raise it with uh, Mauser, Proctor, Zed, Sweet Chuck, uh, the um, Tackleberry's girlfriend's mm. family, oh, you know, yeah. the, the, the dad and the son yeah. who box each other all the time. <laughs> yeah, he should be pretty good at boxing, but my boy is pretty good too. He was on a high school championship team. Huh? Yeah. But I can still take him, right? I don't know, Dad. Take uh, it easy. Huh? <laughs> Come on. No, I don't think so, Dad. Ah, come on, Hannah! Come on! Oh, oh you all right, Dad? Oh, you all right? Yeah, that's pretty good, huh? Oh. I'm sorry, kid, huh? Oh, it's all right, huh? All right, kid. Oh. oh! Good! Yeah, so there's brilliant new characters in this. I think the, the opening sequence is really funny in Sweet Chuck's shop oh, and yeah. everything gets up hello, so trash hello, when, hello. Uh, I think, I know. yeah it's i mean that that whole opening sequence is really funny mm-hmm. uh, we've got lassard's brother who's a really he's good kid. new character as well uh, i think when he phones up eric to say he also oh, needs yeah. some recruits i think he says something like i need to get need my hands man. on some healthy it's young just... men <laughs> <laughs> i know, oh, I know. <laughs> And then the other bit which had me howling with laughter and he's had obviously a really bad couple of weeks and he's driving home and obviously spies a couple of girls or a girl getting attacked (laughs) and he he takes his police car down the street and gets out Mm. and there's like a couple of punks and he's, this is exactly what I was looking for, the jacket off, the sleeves ready to fight them. (laughs) <laughs> and then the whole gang <laughs> appear and surround them. This is just what I've been looking for. Not Come afraid on, of you, punks. Come on. Right here. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh-huh. I ain't going nowhere. Take care of you. Come on, I'll take Why you all off. Come on, I well, want on, you. I'm not afraid of a wall of you. Okay. Yeah, you now it's just you, you and me. You me. Okay, uh-huh. come on. Come on. Come on. I'm tired of talking to you, punk. Well, don't talk I don't want to me, dance. Yeah. I want to get my hands on you. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. You ready to talk to me now? Come on. Show me. Teach me. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay, okay one at a time. Put me down. Come on. Put me down. Put me down. Uh, and I think also the bit in the, I think it's at the Chinese restaurant where the guy's yeah, bashing away, hilarious, yeah. making the, the, the dishes, doing all the fun. <laughs> Is all that crap really necessary? Hey! Oh! Hey! Oh! Hey! 
is all that crap necessary. Hmm. <laughs> I think it's when yeah. the, the, the guy also You're throws stupid. the knife down. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets his gun out, yeah. Mm. That's good. What are, what are some of your other highlights from the movie? Those she talked about, and the bit where he actually comes back after he's been beaten up by all of them, and then... Hey, sir, would you take a look at my hands? I think it's a matter of personal hygiene. I am talking about public safety. Yes, sir. Now listen up, everybody. This is serious. When Mauser goes in for the shower, and then of course they swap the shampoo for glue. And he's going, Captain Mauser, <laughs> yowzy yowzer. They'll say, Captain Mauser, yowzy yowzer. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, 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 oh. Hey. Hey. My hands are stuck to my head. Hey, who's fooling around? What the fuck? Okay. Okay. Let's not fool around, fellas. It's me, and I'm not kidding around. I'm going to take this out of my head. But and then he has to go out, and he's got no clothes on, and he has to go out, and all that. What? What's the good bits? Yeah, I think the, any of the scenes where it's Mahoney and Mauser is a highlight. Mm -hmm. um, I think where he's he's looking at the window, just muttering to himself. I'll have your ass, Mahoney, and Mahoney's actually standing by and he's like, I'm sorry, sir, I'm straight. Mahoney, what, the, what kind of clown do you think I am? A juggling clown? Yeah. Another bit in this movie, which always uh, gets me laughing, is uh, Sweet Chuck, when he's obviously had his arm broken and it's up mm -hmm. in that kind of right angle position and Zed's gang surround him and then he's trying to get away and he turns around and then inadvertently punches out one of the gang and then r runs off into the, the Blue Oyster bar. Oh, 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 come on, man. Huh? Leading to the big gang fight, which is really good. I think Taco Berry's romance is very funny. As well, I think oh, uh, he's uh, coupled up with uh, the woman, and she, she kind of bends over, and he's going, "It's a nice piece." Oh, like, what did you say? I'm, I'm referring, referring to your sidearm. Take care of myself. You just cover your own ass. It's a nice piece. I was referring to your sidearm. By the bit in the bar where he's like Mahoney. I'm a virgin, <laughs> and the whole bar just <laughs> silences mm. him. And, um, and Maho Mahoney's uh, partner in this one, when he goes to visit oh, him, uh, <laughs> and a real slob, yeah, and hey, how you doing? He's, 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 he starts he starts eating the cereal, and one of the cats has obviously done something in it, he just p p mm. pull, <laughs> picks out the bowl, throws it away, and continues Auntie. eating. <laughs> hey, would it be okay if I eat that real quick? Yeah, go ahead, go oh, ahead. Thanks. You know, next to a lunch and dinner, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Oh, jeez. Bunky. Bunky. How many times I gotta tell you? The litter box! The litter box! Hey, you sure you don't want me? I'm on a diet. And here's a fact for you, actually, a good fact for this one. So. Um, Bubba Smith, who played Hightower, he had, he made more money from this film alone than he had playing 10 years of professional football. Mm. And that was because he was smart smart enough to request a 2% um, piece of the movie's profits. That's right. So yeah. he was handsomely Clever. paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. So let's rank this one. Where would you where would you rank it, Paul? I'm guessing it's going to be top, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, top for me as well. Police Academy Queen. Got it. The state says it can no longer afford two police academies. We better, better call Mahoney. Your favorite graduates are back. We're here. Mahoney. We're rubies. What? Hooks. Callahan, Hightower, Crackleberry, 
Do you want to kill me? Butler and Joan. Their mm. assignment. We're going to make one hell of a cop. Thanks, Dad. And would you give this to Mom for me? Oh. Mold a brand new generation of recruits. That, that didn't hurt. Into a fighting machine in a matter of weeks. Shit! Then, together, they're going to save their beloved academy. The only way they know how. By chance. Quick. Police Academy 3, back in training. You're sitting in a non-smoking area. Put it out when I'm finished. You'll put it out now, mister. What they don't know can't stop them. And be remembered not only by name, everybody knows who Hightower is, you know, everybody knows who Mahoney is. <laughs> Why would you want to know my dress size? I'm not putting on no dress. <laughs> and they said, well, uh, this is to catch a, a purse snatcher. Sergeant Hightower, come here. None of my friends in football or nowhere is gonna believe this. Bub got a dress on. <laughs> it's a remarkable uh, franchise in that people all over the world recognize not only the title of the picture, but can remember the names of the players. The little guy with the glasses there is Tim Kazarensky, and I've seen him on Saturday Night Live and on stage in Second City, and I don't know who some of the other people in this movie are, but he's an example, I think, of the waste of talent that Police Academy 3 represents, because I know that he's a funny actor, and if he can't make me laugh in this movie, then there's something wrong with the whole premise. I suppose that the Police Academy movies are trying to do something sort of innocent and harmless in their own way, at a time when so many movies are filled with high-tech violence and soul-searching despair and the sex lives of obnoxious adolescents. Here's a movie that only wants to be good, dumb fun. It comes out of the tradition of Abbott and Costello and the Three Stooges. The trouble is, those old comedies had a certain crazy energy level, a certain method to their madness. And they had characters who got developed to the point where you could care what happened to them. Police Academy 3, like parts 1 and 2, never cranks up the energy to make it funny enough. Cranks up the energy is precisely the point. This thing is directed as if it were asleep. I mean, it mm -hmm. is very slow, methodical. You saw the speed there. This movie, if it's going to work, the jokes have to follow one on top of another right. so that you're laughing and then the next one comes and you're laughing on top and this audience is exploding with laughter. Mm -hmm. That's the way Amel Brooks works with uh, gags. That's the way Laurel and Hardy work. That's this, right. this thing is just done in, in slow motion and the gags aren't I funny. think what they're trying to do here, because the first two had more of a story than this one, this one is only episodic gags, is they're trying to make a movie like Airplane or like Top Secret and the problem is you put your finger right on it, by so fast that you feel like you're missing stuff. Right. The moment you have the, mo the chance to stop and think in a movie like this, it's all over. I had plenty of chances to stop and think, <laughs> to look around at the room, to see uh, people who were sitting next to me, to talk to friends, go back to visit the projectionist, go to the bathroom, anything but look at that screen. That brings us to Police Academy 3, back in training, released in 1986, and again directed by Jerry Paris. So the plot for this one, when the governor announces the state can't afford to keep both of its police academies open, Commandant Lassard and Commandant Mauser are pitted against one another. Lassard asks some of his old cadets, including Sergeant Mahoney, to train the new recruits, who include High Strong Sweet Chuck, played by Tim Kazarinsky, and Loud Mouse said, played by Bobcat Goldway. As Evaluation Day approaches, each side tries to sabotage the other. So the gross on this one, it grossed $107 million worldwide on a budget of $12 million, so it made almost nine times its budget, and it was the 17th highest grossing movie of 1986. And this continues the trend of each sequel doing less than its predecessor. Uh, there is a movie mistake in here, around the 54 minute mark during the song by Sergeant Hooks and Lieutenant Callahan at the Policeman's Ball. The camera alternates between shots of the Sard's cassette uh, cadets having fun while Mauser's cassette, uh, cadets stay in their seats and show no emotion. When it goes to wide shots of the room, you can actually see Mauser's cadets dancing and having a good time. So ratings wise, it has a 36% Rotten Tomatoes critic score, a 39% Rotten Tomatoes audience score, 5.4 out of 10 IMDb audience rating and 
33 out of 100 critic meta score. And here's a fact for you Jerry Paris, the director of Police Academy 2 and 3, um, he had an affair with Leslie Easterbrook on the set of the movie, and Easterbrook plays uh, Sergeant Callahan. Uh, so they had an affair while making this movie, and Jerry Paris actually died 10 days after the film's American release. If memory serves, he had uh, he'd been diagnosed with a brain tumour and he died due to complications from a, an operation to try and fix that. And then somebody, yeah, decent film, but feels pretty much just more of the same laughs. Uh, the franchise had breached its peak and was now sadly on the wane. Also, Police Academy 3. Do you remember seeing this at the cinema back in the day? Yes, we saw this in Jersey, 1986. We do go to the cinema in Edinburgh as well. It's just it seems to be always we mention Jersey when we watch a lot of these films. Uh, so, yeah, I remember seeing it then and really enjoying it, actually, at the time. And now, what do you think of it? It's all right. It's, it's, unfortunately, it's the start of a decline, really. <laughs> I mean, there's some decent bits in it, but it's just, yeah, there's something lacking that they never really recapture from the first two. But there's still some funny moments in it. What about you? What are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, it becomes really clear here that it's very much now there's a formula and this is where they stick to it going forward with diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like uh, Hooks, who's always quiet, suddenly shouting at some point, usually at a bad guy. Mahoney getting angry mm -hmm. and going over the top with his gun to get somebody to do something. Um, but like all these things, it's less funny the more it's repeated uh, with it. But, I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's good stuff in it. I think it's, uh, it's funny. Uh, Sweet Chuck and Zed joining the, the police and obviously being roommates as well, mm -hmm. which, which was good. Um, yeah. I think it was good to have the I forget their names, the two kind of jerks from oh, the first movie. Blank. Yeah. Is it Copeland and Blanks? Or yeah. Mm. I think so, yeah. So it's good good to have them them back uh, in there. In terms of funny moments, I think one of the best bits was the guy who's in the dark and, and he's meant to be IDing the person that had I think mugged them or oh, yeah. robbed them or something. <laughs> And he's like, mm -hmm. and he's like, well, are you sure? You sure they can't see me? And he went, no, they can't see. It's light up there. It's dark in here. And he's like, right, stands up. It's him. Just as the light goes on in the room, <laughs> and the guy sees him. I'll kill you. <laughs> now, Mr. Miller, I want you to take your time, study these men very carefully. Then tell us if you see the man who robbed your store. Let me reassure you, Mr. Miller. The suspects cannot see you when it's dark in here. Well, Mr. Miller, is he there? Are you sure they can't see me? My wife said they'd see me, said not to do this. Mr. Miller, bright lights in there, dark in here. He can't see us. Do you see him? How hard can it be, Miller? Is he there or isn't he? I don't know. He really didn't steal that much. Well, the hospital stay was quite restful. I wish I'd listened to my wife. Oh, for God's sake, Miller, will you take your balls out of your wife's purse and finger the dirt bag? It's him. Oh, it's him. He's the one, the priest. Oh, that was good. Um, in terms of things, I didn't like it. I think the chase bit at the end was a bit too long. You know, on the jet skis and mm -hmm. all that. That seemed to go yeah. on a bit too long. And it just seems to it, it just seems to abruptly end. <laughs> it's like, oh right, it's finished then, is it? For the end. And other than Zed and Sweet Chuck, who are from the last movie, I don't know if any of the other new recruits really make much of a an impression. Or you've kind of got the posh guy. Um, but other than the, mm -hmm. in the beginning where 
he asks uh, Hightower to help him with his bags, which is quite funny, and Hightower mm -hmm. throws him away. Oh, Porter! Red Cap? That's right. Could you uh, help me with these, please? That's right. Come on over here. That'll be fine. Thank you. Order. Other than that, yeah, uh, none of the new characters really hit at all, I would say. The female in it that Mahoney, we talked about earlier, instantly subtracted to her role. She, she was in Baywatch, wasn't she? Do you know the... Oh, was she? Yeah, I remember. So she, that would have been a, maybe three, four years before it. But she was in that. Yeah, but there's no, right. nothing really, nothing really stands out. But I do like... They're having the big sort of party at the end and Proctor ends up having no clothes on and he's in the hallway and all that and he's just got that that bin lid <laughs> cover. That and then good. Mauser, Mahoney's like trying to capture Mauser, like ca catch him out and he, he electrocutes him and he goes, what would you like to say? And he goes, Mahama, ha, Mahama, Mahama. He would like to say Mahama. <laughs> you know that bit? Yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I think the other thing we're talking about that, yeah, and the second movie we had Mauser obviously getting his hand stuck to the top of his head mm -hmm. and obviously he loses a lot of his hair because of that and wears the wig and this one you've literally got the same gag again but this time it's his eyebrows so it's not as funny it's that yeah. repetition of things now mm -hmm. no it's still a sporadically funny movie so it's not yeah. bad or anything it's uh, but not as good as the um, as good as the first two I would say so, if we're going to... Oh, and in fact, that's what I was going to mention to you, which I just found out. Um, do you know how in the movie, the the Japanese cop in it, uh, Nogata? Nogata? Yeah, yeah. Now, at, the, at a couple of points in it, you find out he's sleeping on a bed of nails. Oh, yeah, and he liked to meditate, and he held his mm -hmm. hand over the candle. That's because the character was originally written as an Indian police cadet named mm. Ramu, uh, but mm. they then changed it in the script, but that, that remained over, because uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense, uh, somebody from Japan sleeping on a bed of nails, or that kind of thing, so there we are, that was, uh, that was what was changed. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you, uh, or where would you rank Police Academy 3, top, middle, or lower tier? Middle. Yep, I'm with you there, middle tier, yeah. um, for Police Academy 3. And who might you be? Oh, a Tomoko Nogata of Tochikawa Nogatas. Oh, and is this your lovely wife? Mm. Doctor? Yes, sir! What's the story here with Fu Manchu? Fu Manchu? I don't have a Fu Manchu. I'm talking about the stir-fried shrimp from out of town. Oh, uh, he's with the Tochikawa Highway Patrol, part of an international exchange program, here to study our methods. I'm not teaching my cadets how to use a wok. <laughs> You ship him off to Lasage, he'll fit in perfectly over there. He could use a good sushi chef. No offense, eh? Arigato. Thank you. Kiss my what? Like Trimming the Movie Fat. Why not check out our other podcast, Trimming the Musical Fat? Okay, well, what do you think of the, the first three Police Academy movies? Where would you rank them yourself? Uh, get in touch with us. And you can find how to do that in the episode description. So yeah, email, Facebook, and so on. And come back for the next episode where we're looking at these academies four, five, six, and mission to Moscow. And I have to say, I've not seen any of these. Well, maybe with the exception of six, I don't think I've seen four and five in decades. And I've never seen Mission to Moscow, which I hear is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it could make for a very interesting discussion in the next show. Um, and, and a perverse way, I'm looking forward to Mission to Moscow because I've heard it's so bad. Uh, come back for that next month. So we'll rank all seven movies in order of preference at the end of the next episode. But for the first three, I think we'll, we're both in agreement. Third place, the third one. Second place, the first movie. First place, the second movie. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Well, we hope you enjoyed uh, watching and listening to the show and do come back next month for the concluding part. Until then, keep trimming. Trimming the Movie Fat is a Stephen and Paul Nicholson production. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us by voicemail via the Spotify link in the episode description. You can email us at trimmingthemusicfat at gmail.com. Keep up to date with the show and access exclusive content by joining our Facebook group, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on TikTok. You can also check out our website at trimmingthemusicalfat.com. Thanks for listening.